Hello everyone, I want to start this video by wishing you and your family a Merry Christmas and all the best for 2020. Also, I want to say thanks to Merriam Webster's Dictionary. Not that they sponsor this video, but this video contains a lot of difficult words that I had to look up. And as I am not a native English speaker, I might mispronounce some of these words. So if I do so, please forgive me. That being said, let's get started. In Dutch we have a saying, je hebt een taalknobbel, which literally translates as you have a lump for languages. But if you want to say the same thing in proper English, you would use something along the lines of you have a head for languages. This old Dutch saying comes from the age-old science of phrenology, a pseudoscience that did have some positive influence on our current day neuroscience. If you ever want to impress a dumb person, just tell them that you're a neuroscientist who specializes in phrenology. You just have to feel their head and make some predictions on their mental traits. And in this video, I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know about phrenology. Welcome to Brains Applied. Our understanding of how the brain works was historically rather late in comparison to our anatomical understanding. In the 4th century BC, Aristotle noted how the brain size to body size ratio was greater for more intellectually advanced species, such as humans. However, the old man believed that the brain served as a cooling system for our heart, which he saw as our cognitive center, reasoning that the higher your intellect was, the more cooling you needed. He wasn't corrected until the 2nd century AD by the Roman doctor Claudius Galenus, who was able to study the corpses of gladiators who had their heads smashed in in the amphitheater of Pergamum. However, he mostly studied animals as Roman law forbade him to dissect human cadavers. Galenus concluded that our mental experiences resided in the ventricles. The ventricular system is one of the evolutionary older parts of our brain and according to him each of the three ventricles housed one of the three souls that made up our consciousness. As a consequence only the core part of our brain was well studied for the upcoming 1500 years. Until in the late 18th century the German Franz Josef Gall came along. At a young age he had noticed how people were different. His classmates were very good at learning things by heart, even the matter that they didn't understand, while he himself excelled at reasoning and reflecting. And after some time he noticed that those who had such a great memory often had very prominent eyes. And it was here that his studies started. At first he started in craniometry, in which he tried to find a link between people's talents and the whole form of their heads. Later he noticed that the cortex of humans was much larger than those of animals, and he believed that this was what makes humans superior. Eventually he decided to go his own scientific way, in which he made five assumptions. Assumption number one. The brain is the organ of the mind. Assumption 2. The brain actually consists out of 27 organs, with each function having its own location. Assumption 3. Organs that are related to each other are grouped together. Assumption 4. The relative size of the organs is an indication of the power or strength of that organ. Assumption number 5. The relative size of the organs can be estimated by inspecting the contours of the skull, as the skull fits the brain like a glove. Agal was the first researcher in history to come up with the notion of functional specialization, which is still used today. However, he had a rather interesting research method that led him to make the wrong assumptions. Basically, he would gather a bunch of people who had a similar trait, and then he would look and feel at their skulls whether they had similar bumps or dimples. Meaning that if he met plenty of stubborn people who had a bump over here, this would be the location of stubbornness. 
Now I'm not going to name all of the 27 organs that Gaal initially found, but there were some pretty interesting ones, like the instinct of reproduction, parental love, fidelity and destructiveness, which does include the tendency to murder. Gaal was not the only researcher who worked on this science. Gaal worked together with Johann Spurzheim, his assistant and later co-author. After the men got into an argument for unknown reasons, they parted ways and Spurzheim identified six more potential organs and he came up with the term phrenology and through his books he managed to popularize the science. From the start on, there were scientists who opposed this idea of phrenology. But it became rather popular. Hundreds of people became members of the phrenological societies where they learned about the new science and where they tried to contribute to it. And Queen Victoria and Prince Albert even invited the founder of the Edinburgh Phrenological Society, George Combe, to read the heads of their children. Phrenology was huge and people loved it as it allowed them to read people's character based on the shapes of their heads. Now, as you might know, we people are very different. Men on average are taller, more muscular and have more facial hair growth than women. And our skulls differ as much as our bodily forms, with as a consequence that phrenologists thought that men had a larger social regions, with high organs of force, pride, energy and self-reliance. Women, on the other hand, were more developed in phyloprogenitiveness, adhesiveness and inhabitiveness, as can be seen in a 19th century textbook. And of course, there are differences between races as well. Caucasian people have a forehead that is more prominent and high, meaning that they have more intellectual power and a strong moral. Or to say it with a nice quote from a phrenology handbook, the special organs in which the Caucasian brain most excels and which distinguish it from those of all less advanced races are mirthfulness, ideality and conscientiousness. The organs of these faculties being almost invariably small in savage and barbarous tribes. Next, they show a sketch of the skull of a North American Indian and honestly, I've no clue where they found this sketch. It seems to be a sketch of some character of the family guy. And of course, they also compare it with the Negro skull. And then they continue to say that in this type of skull, animal feelings predominate over both intellect and moral sentiment. However, next to Europeans trying to see themselves as superior to people from ethnic groups, phrenology actually did do something good in the field of criminology. While Gall thought that the different organs could not be changed, Spurzheim thought that organs could be trained. And he also believed that no organ in itself was evil. He thought that a disproportionate enlargement of a faculty would lead to imbalance and thus criminal behavior. Covetiveness, the desire to acquire and possess, would for example be a positive thing as it motivates us to work hard. But when this faculty becomes overdeveloped, people would become more inclined to steal. Therefore, phrenologists argue that people should not be punished for their deeds but helped because being exposed to punishments such as public execution would brutalize even the most innocent spectator. They lobbied against the death sentence and other violent punishments, such as whipping, because they would only make things worse. They rather favored prisons with fresh air and good food, in which a prisoner can train habits of sobriety, order and industry, and at the same time he must be furnished with intellectual, moral and religious instruction. In the end, phrenology was one of the factors that led to prisons becoming more focused on the reformation of their inmates. Yet phrenology itself was debunked as a pseudoscience rather soon as phrenologists never agreed on the amount of organs and their locations in the first place. And experiments with animals had shown that brain damage either resulted in no loss of function or loss of completely different functions than what was predicted by phrenologists. 
and by using modern day brain scanners we are totally able to disprove phrenology. And that my friends is all I wanted to tell you today. I hope you liked this video, if you did press the like button and of course don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you receive a 100% free notification next time when I upload a new video. And I will see you guys later.